Welcome back to my channel my friends. So today we're going to go into the science of how to build skeletal muscle. Now we could go into the biochemical pathways and I would, I would love that. I've got textbooks all about it. I, I'm ready to take a freaking exam on it. But I feel like that's not really that helpful for 99.9% .9 of us. What we really want to know is how are we going to build that muscle baby? So we're going to have a look at how to effectively build muscle. We're going to be covering the drivers of muscle growth, picking the right weight for the perfect number of reps per set, training to failure, exercise volume, which is the number of sets per week, frequency, rest times, progressive overload, exercise selection, and tempo. This video is going to specifically look at the training optimizations for building muscle and in the future I'll do a video about nutrition and other elements that also help with building muscle. Now that's a pretty serious list of training variables. By the end of this, you guys are going to be experts. You're going to be like, alright Natasha, I'll take it from here. Honestly, building muscle is such an incredible thing to do for yourself. There's no better feeling than feeling strong. I mean, for me, when I feel strong physically, I feel strong mentally. And it also allowed me to shape my body and did so much for increasing my metabolism, which then makes fat loss so much easier. I have covered the science of metabolism in the past, but I am gonna cover it again soon. So if you guys like these types of videos, make sure to give me a big thumbs up, hit the subscribe button to join our incredible family because you are incredible. I will always say that. Yeah. Let's build some muscle. Let's get to know how to build some muscle. Before we get into it, I do just want to cover two little caveats. The first is that I wouldn't worry about trying to perfect every single training variable. Compliance is the key. Think of these as suggestions. If any of these suggestions are going to compromise your enjoyment of working out, then get out of here. I mean, get them out of here. And the second caveat is that the science here is still quite limited. Muscle hypertrophy doesn't get the same kind of funding and attention that other topics in human biology do. We can't be overly confident in any conclusions that we can't yet draw. So there is still a lot of grey and we're just learning together. So let's start off with what is muscle hypertrophy? Muscle hypertrophy is the enlargement of total muscle mass and cross-sectional area. And it happens when the rate of muscle protein synthesis is greater than muscle protein breakdown, which leaves you in a positive net protein balance. So how does muscle actually grow? And I want to touch on this quickly because it will help us understand the training optimizations later. But over the last 15 years, scientists have hypothesized three main drivers of muscle growth. Mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. So mechanical tension is when there's a stretching force on the muscle. So when a muscle is contracting and elongating under load. Mechanical tension actually increases as we approach failure, increasing the stress on the muscle fibers as they start to fatigue. The second hypothesis was that muscle damage was also a driver of muscular growth. And I feel like I hear this one all the time. And I think it's because researchers kept noticing that resistance training causes damage in a number of muscle tissue components, like the myofibrils and the sarcolemma. But with further research, a bunch of systematic reviews, which basically look at all of the literature in that topic found that muscle damage is not necessary for muscle hypertrophy. In fact, one review suggested that when there's a high level of muscle damage, most of that protein synthesis, which is the creation of new protein molecules, goes into repairing that damage rather than muscle hypertrophy. The third potential driver is metabolic stress, which is the accumulation of metabolites like inorganic phosphates, lactate, hydrogen ions, and the deprivation of oxygen in the muscles that happens when we do resistance training. It's believed that metabolic stress is the driver of cell swelling. Now you guys already know cell swelling very well. We call it the pump. Now reviewing all of the research in 2019, a team of researchers, including some of the biggest names in the area, concluded that muscle damage and metabolic stress are not necessary for muscle hypertrophy. So what does that mean? That means that mechanical tension is actually really freaking important. And it also means that things like muscle soreness that we believe come from muscle damage or a juicy pump that we believe comes from metabolic stress, 
might not be the best indicators that you've had a good muscle building workout. So now we're gonna look at the training variables that you guys can tweak to have amazing muscle building workouts. And the first is the number of reps per set. So obviously for any given exercise, the weight you choose will determine how many reps you can do per set before you need to take a break. And this is what researchers call intensity. So when you increase the weight, you're lowering the reps, but that's what researchers call increasing the intensity. Now for years, the popular belief amongst weightlifters was that eight to 12 rep range was the sweet spot for building muscle. Going lower than that was for strength, going higher than that was for muscular endurance, but they weren't great for building muscle. But in 2021, a review of the research found that that's probably not the case. And actually the effective rep range is probably a lot wider than just eight to 12 reps, as long as you're pushing close to failure in each set. So dropping the weight and going for sets of 15 to 30 or increasing the weight and going for sets of below eight seem just as good. But for managing risks of overtraining and injury, rep ranges of six to 30 seem to be an effective, safe way of training for the general population. But there is a limit though. That doesn't mean we can just see you later to the weights. Because they found that if you're lifting weights less than 30% of your one rep max, which would mean that you're probably doing sets of 30 plus reps, then it was less effective for building muscle. So this is actually really important. I feel like I get asked about this all the time. Let's say you're brand new to an exercise, you don't know which weight to pick, or you've picked a weight, you're mid set and you're like, ah, oh, I think I've gone too heavy or too light. The thing is, it doesn't matter. As long as you're pushing close to failure, we've got such a wide effective rep range that as long as you're going close to failure, it's okay. Stay focused and locked in and complete that set properly. It will still be contributing to muscle hypertrophy. I still like to keep the bulk of my sets in the six to 15 rep range, just so that I keep it nice and tight, you know, nice and time efficient. We got shit to do, you know, people to see, things to do. Now talking about going close to failure brings up the obvious question. Should we go to failure? Going to failure is where you want to do that last rep, but you have to back out of it. You just can't, you're trying, you really are, that's failure. Now there are two systematic reviews which compiled all the best research in this area and they were published really recently which can help us out and they concluded that when training volume was equalized both agree that there seems to be similar muscle building results amongst groups training to failure and those training just short of failure so like one to three reps away from failure now it's possible that there may be some advantage to training to failure if you're training with really low weight and high rep ranges but on balance there doesn't seem to be any evidence that is any more beneficial so i like to train within one to three reps from failure. I actually think that regularly training to failure adds a level of fatigue and mental intimidation. I feel like the most important thing is compliance. If you're, if you're telling me that we're going to go to failure every workout, I'm busy that day. Like <laughs> working out should be something you look forward to. I don't look forward to failing at every set. One to three reps away, I can do that. But failure at every set? I already feel like I can hear your next question. Great question, by the way. How many sets should we be doing? AKA volume. We touched on this already in my how to build the perfect training routine video, but researchers like to measure volume in terms of sets per muscle per week. So for example, the number of sets targeting your glutes per week for optimal muscle growth. Now a 2016 systematic review found that increasing the number of sets per muscle per week was a significant driver of muscle growth. But the vast majority of studies only test subjects up to 12 sets per muscle per week. And what happens beyond that point is still really unclear. The authors of that paper in 2016 concluded that it remains unclear as to where the upper threshold lies as to the dose response relationship between resistance training volume and muscular growth. And my view is that the research since 2016 hasn't convincingly cleared that up. I mean, there are tests that have gone to 15, 20, 30 plus sets per muscle per week, 
but they don't agree on if there's a plateau and where that plateau is. So my advice here is to aim for at least 12 sets per muscle per week for your high priority muscles. And that might look like four exercises completed for three sets each per week. Now if you feel like you can sustainably add extra high quality well rested sets then that's great but most coaches and researchers agree that there are diminishing returns somewhere in that ballpark of 10 to 25 sets per muscle per week. So that means that the value of each extra set is slowly going down. If you feel like you've hit a plateau for a particular muscle group and you're below that 12 to 15 sets per week ballpark, then it might be worth adding some extra sets, assuming that you're well rested and eating enough um, to try and overcome that plateau. So next up is frequency. Frequency is how often you hit a muscle. Now the way to think about frequency without getting it confused with volume is, let's say I wanna train my triceps for 12 to 15 sets per week. Do I do all of those sets in one session or should I spread those sets over three separate days? The simple answer here is that it doesn't really matter. The research doesn't find a statistically significant effect of frequency on muscle gain. And the effect size seems to be pretty small. So any possible influence is probably really insignificant anyway. Now the slightly more complicated answer <sighs> because there, there's always got to be one, is that frequency might make a difference if it allows you to increase the volume. So let's say for example, quads is a really important muscle group for you and you want to train them 15 to 20 sets per week. Let's say you have one leg day. That means you're going to be trying to do your 20 sets of quads in that one workout. It doesn't leave you much time for your hamstrings and calves, in reality, unless you're in the gym all day. So increasing the frequency by adding an extra leg day, you have time to do your 10 sets of quads on that day, plus hamstrings and calves, and you can actually hit the volume that you intended for your quads. So the next thing I wanna talk about is rest intervals. How long should you be resting between sets? Now, there isn't a huge amount of science or credible science that we can really draw from right now, and there are a lot of methodological issues, but this is what we know so far. When reviewing studies comparing workouts with short rest periods, up to 60 seconds, versus long rest periods, so 80 to 240 seconds, pooled analysis showed a non-significant advantage to the long interset rest condition. We can't be sure yet, but the consensus amongst researchers is that longer rest periods being optimal fits with our understanding of muscle hypertrophy. Volume load is the total weight lifted during a workout, so think of it as reps times sets times weight lifted. During rest periods, our strength capacity recovers. That's what allows us to hit 12 fresh reps even though a minute ago, we were just one to three reps away from failure. Longer rest periods allow you to keep hitting those sets at the same number of reps, keeping that weight high, and just generally keeping the volume load high. That's why I love my rests, you know? But this might just be one of those times where what's optimal isn't necessarily practical. If you're increasing your rest time from one minute to three minutes, you might have added 30 minutes of rest in your session. And it might be that by increasing the rest time that you give yourself, you're actually decreasing your total volume load by reducing the amount of sets you have time for. So a balance of the two seems to be a smart way to go here. I like to have a minimum of 60 seconds of rest to allow my strength capacity to return so that I can hit that next set without compromising my form, without dropping the weight and doing the same number of reps. But I expect there are diminishing returns on the longer I take rest. So I just go as soon as I feel like I can hit that next set properly. That might take a bit of time to develop. So a good ballpark is one to two minutes rest. And as you get more experienced, you'll know. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna talk about is progressive overload. Progressive overload or progressive resistance is key to keep in mind when trying to drive muscle growth. Progressive overload is essentially increasing the mechanical tension that you're putting your muscles under over time. So that could look like increasing the weight over time, it could look like increasing the volume load over time, so either increasing the number of reps you're doing per set or increasing the number of sets you're doing, or it could just be improving your form. So making sure that your form is really targeting the muscles that you want to target. 
and that's also progressive overload. 2.5 to 5% changes in progressive overload week on week in either of those three categories is perfect. And that can be really easy to miss, so give yourself a bit of time to look for changes. And don't expect all of that change to be coming from a single category of progressive overload, like the weight that you're lifting. Now I want to move on to exercise selection. Are you going to be choosing compound movements or isolation movements? Compound movements are multiple joint movements, so you've got lots of different muscles all engaging all at once. The humble squat's your perfect example. You've got primary joint action at the knees, hips and ankles, the main muscles contracting being your quads and glutes, and then you've got supporting talent from your hamstrings, core and calves. Isolation exercises are single joint movements. If you're doing isolation movements just right, everything else is just locked in. You've got it all on lockdown. Compound movements engage far more muscle mass, making them a way more efficient driver of total body hypertrophy. <laughs> I feel like my face lights up when I say compound. I just love compound movements. Why? Because they transfer to real life and to sport. Like that is just how your body moves as a whole. <laughs> I feel like it's really hard to find a sport where tricep push down or where you're going to be doing a tricep push down, where everything else is on lock. I'm genuinely, what would that... Oh, that's basically darts, isn't it? Dar darts! Alright, darts! I take it back. Eyes laser focused, core engaged, everything on lockdown. Tricep engagement. Now I'm really not bashing isolation movements, I think they're amazing for tidying up asymmetries and imbalances. Say you've got one quad stronger than the other. Isolating your weaker quad and really working on it could really help balance out that asymmetry. And if you do go for unilateral movements where you're targeting each side individually, start with your weaker side. Because if you start with your stronger side, there's a chance you'll pick a weight that's too heavy for your weak side. So you're going to compromise your form. So start with your weak side. Isolation is also amazing for adding muscle in particular areas that you really want to work on. So it's like that fine tune, like chisel, like that Michelangelo eye. I always think it makes sense to start your workouts off with those heavy compound free weighted movements like squats, deadlifts and bench press because that's where the risk of injury is at its highest from form breakdown. I think it's really important to go into those moves feeling physically and mentally fresh so that you can focus on your technique cues. I also feel like these moves are perfect for tracking progressive overload because they're more full body measures of progress and you're keeping them at the start so it's more consistent, you're not fatigued some weeks and some weeks not and it's just a really it's much more accurate to measure your progressive overload. Now I want to talk about exercise repetition versus variation because traditionally there's a real emphasis on exercise repetition, so repeating the same core movement patterns over and over and over again and the idea is that it's easy for you to track your progressive overload. And I do agree that those fundamental movement patterns like squat, deadlift, lunges, pull-ups and press-ups are an incredible base to build your training around, but I also think there are two massive things that make training with variety really valuable. The first is enjoyment and motivation. In reality, the best programs think about compliance just as much as they think about optimizations, and it's honestly so rare to see. Research shows that people prefer their workouts when their workouts have more variation in them. I guess a nice way to think about it is if you go to the gym and you see people there that have been going for years, they're regularly coming and they push themselves. And you might ask yourself the question, why don't I have that? Why don't I have that motivation? Why do I feel like I'm just out of discipline showing up? Maybe the question to ask is, am I excited by going to the gym? Do I look forward to my workouts? And variety might be the answer to that. It might be just what you need to keep your program exciting and something that you look forward to. For me, if there was no variety and I was sticking to the same moves every day, <laughs> there would be no channel. I'm telling you that for free. The second thing is functionality. Being functional allows you to move in ways that carry over to real life and in sport. So you can move like a badass 
as on top of looking like one. And those classic controlled movements that are great for hypertrophy remove a lot of the variables that make a successful athlete, like engaging multiple planes of movement, coordination, a powerful core for dynamic stabilization and anti-rotation, power, and just being comfortable with a wide range of movement patterns. By centering your workouts around those fundamental muscle building movements and blending in those functional compound movement patterns, you can get that sweet spot where you're building muscle, you're moving functionally, and you just enjoy your workouts. It's basically the basis for my Build Reload program. Um, it's available on natashalcm.com. And whatever routine you're doing, I hope that it's making you love how you feel, love how you're moving, and that you're getting results, because it will make it 10 times, if not 100 times easier to stick to that routine. The last thing I wanna talk about is tempo. That classic tip that always makes its way around the gym is that you gotta go slow. Get that time under tension. The idea is that you get more rep for your buck. In reality, it's not that simple. There are factors at play here, like how motor unit activation and volume seem to be affected when we slow the tempo down. And that means that it's not necessarily optimal for muscle hypertrophy. And that could be why systematic reviews don't find a relationship between rep tempo and hypertrophy. It seems that using a mix of tempos right now is a great place to start whilst we try and figure out what's going on. I like it because it can be transferred to sport better to be prepared for slow and fast movement. And also just because you're spreading that attention and love across the fast and slow twitch muscle fibers. Now obviously I'm assuming that if you're doing something fast it's with good form. If it's not with good form, gotta slow it down. Take it down a notch until your form is good. And then you can speed back up again. And interestingly, and this is just preliminary, like I'm just sharing it, it's just across the coffee table just as friends, Early research has suggested that when you perform the move slowly in the eccentric phase and fast in the concentric phase, it seems to be favorable to hypertrophy. And if you guys remember when I trained with Nevin Harrison, who was an Olympic champion at 19, a world champion at 17, she did a lot of this kind of training. Slow on the eccentric, fast on the concentric. But again, it's just friends, we're friends across the coffee table, across the screen. I'm just sharing some preliminary early research. And that is everything I wanted to cover. You guys are set, <laughs> you're good now. If you are on your journey to building muscle, I believe in you. It takes time, it really does take time. Keep showing up, keep making sure that you're enjoying your workouts because it makes the process so much easier. But I believe in you every step of the way. I can't wait for you to be a badass. Be a badass, be a strong badass. I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a big thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button to make sure that you don't miss any more videos around muscle building, around fat loss, around training, around anything. And I love you so much. And I'll see you guys very soon. Bye.